Yet the studying of pornography means asking vital questions about sexuality, desire, and the self that porn articulates. Similarly, pornography can also be seen as a center around which larger questions and fears about internet surge or how pornography is deemed answerable to discussions around sex work and labor conditions uh, you know, comes to the picture. So the way I'm employing the word or phrase use in today's talk is reminiscent of the larger debates and conventions that um, followed pornography in the 1970s pro-censorship debates to the immediate conversations that we are having on the role of porn aggregators like Pornhub and the use uh, of data analytics to offer metrics of porn consumption in different parts of the world. So just want to quickly go over a few things. Uh, so this is how uh, Pornhub is seen as a part of the larger cultural conglomeration. Uh, and they came up with this kind of announcement that they're using biometric technology to verify the users to ensure that uh, you know, none of the um, videos that are uploaded are uh, emerging out of any kind of exploitative practices like no revenge porn or um, child porn enters into the, uh, into the porn website, the porn hub. Um, now, I want to quickly show you um, something which I thought might, might be interesting because this is um, Leela uh, Vendrup's uh, you know, documentary called Shakedown. This is a documentary that takes the viewers to the Black Lesbian Strip Club uh, in Los Angeles. And this was a particular artwork that is commissioned by Pornhub a um, couple of years back. And one of the reasons why they wanted to incorporate artwork as part of their platform is also kind of a PR strategy to come across as you know, female friendly and emphasizing female sexual desire, et cetera. So initially, uh, if you think about Pornhub as a platform, uh, they uh, were there were also other tube sites like Exhamster and Uporn that were offered free, just like YouTube. Um, and they were constantly pirating um, content, like uh, ripped from DVDs alongside other user-generated content. But MindGeek, the company which Pornhub, uh, you know, is run by currently, they basically soon, uh, you know, brought all the companies that were in the market. And it was like swallowing all the companies and then you know, coming across as like a monopoly. And that's when they decided that they need to come across as uh, you know, friendly to the users, not just as a kind of consumerist platform trying to uh, you know, leverage out of the profits uh, emerging out of sexually explicit videos. So let's take a quick look at this uh, documentary. So keep in mind, this is about a black gay strip club and please uh, listen to the, the audio track that accompanies it because that's where the, the sense of identity as a, a stripper or what it is to actually run a strip club when you have your own kind of feminist ideologies in place that come to play. Listen up. If you stray, you don't need to be in the front, period. If you're not going to tip and you straight, you don't need to be in the front, but don't disrespect by moving out the way with somebody performing a show. Thank you. Check this out. I don't mean to applaud anybody, but this is a gay club. Please don't disrespect my dancers. They dance for girls. If you don't like it, just have a seat, boo boo, okay? It's a G club. Don't get offended by that, okay? You guys are screaming out for change. We don't do that at this club. This is no longer a ghetto club, so don't act like it. LAPD is running through this motherfucker. So again, if you don't like it, ladies, just don't look. Let's move on. The battle zone begins. Being Asia is a whole different element of life. It's a whole different design of being a person. It's like I can just be me at all times, you know? All right. So one of the reasons why I wanted to actually show you the clip from, uh, you know, Wendrup's documentary is to show that pornography is not always about explicit sex. For instance, this particular documentary do have, uh, you know, references to nude bodies. And it's, again, a, a gay strip club. But the way in which the documentary is framing the narrative is about the idea of respect. These are performers who are doing it. This is bodily service, but at the same time, they do have certain uh, element of control and agency in terms of what they want to do. And you know, you cannot touch their body. So the, the way in which agency is kind of you know superscribed into the subtext of uh, the conversation is very interesting. Listen. All right. So. Um, 
going back to the question about use, use and use value. And why is it that when we talk about porn, we do not talk about it as part of an academic discipline? Now, uh, things have changed in the last few years. When I started my PhD at JNU in 2011, um, you know, things were up in the air. There were not really like much work emerging in India um, considering porn work as a larger uh, framing device or a disciplinary kind of orientation, except, um, you know, uh, Ratish Radhakrishnan's article that came out in the uh, book edited by Meena, there was no, there were a few, uh, you know, references to Malayalam soft porn here and there, but not an academic study in itself. And hence, when I was starting my project, I was also looking out for, you know, pre previously pre-existing kind of academic orientations that I can, uh, you know, I can engage with. And that's where the adult film history special interest group that was formed in 2013 became important because this is Society for Cinema and Media Studies, the largest organization, uh, professional organization for uh, scholars working in film studies. And they started to think about adult film as a category in itself. And there were a lot of scholars working in different parts of the world who were, uh, you know, all interested in working on adult cinema. And now the special interest group has emerged as like a, a full-fledged platform for scholars to engage, network, to learn from each other, etc. These are some of the books that have come out of the engagement with porn studies. Now, my entry point to uh, today's talk is mediated by Sarah Ahmed because of two reasons. First of all, when I started my project 10 years back, uh, one of the persistent questions that I had to respond to was, what was the use of my work? And what ways was it shifting our existing knowledge on how sexually explicit media operate in public cultures. So the realm of pleasure was seen as an um, uh, arena of research that's associated with privilege. Only those who have the wherewithal to sit back and relax can afford to do it. Instead, what was suggested as possible means of interrogation included topics that show tangible use value and stems from the research that can push for immediate intervention on a policy level change. So many of the anxieties that underlie the responses, uh, such responses were conditioned again by this idea of use value, set of practices that can uh, direct subjects towards useful ends. Michael Warner uh, refers to this as a struggle for control uh, that's based on insecurity and fear. And for me, using the larger framing of porn also means addressing questions of form, genre, history, industry status, and spectatorship. Uh, when I was completing my graduate studies, which was like in the last two years, I was forewarned by my mentors on the possible hurdles that I might face with job interviews, how porn related research has been considered as part of unserious research, at least from some segments in academia, and the need to build a profile that can showcase my strength as a researcher, as there is always this tendency to be scrutinized more if I were to work, um, if I were to um, more uh, scrutinize more if I were to work on other topics. So the, the counter strategy suggested was to anchor the conceptual framing of the project and its relevance as a front off mechanism that can speak to a recalcitrant traditionalist or conventional film historian who might have prob problems with the pawn part of my project, um, but still appreciate the conceptual value that I bring to the table. So scholars who work on pornography have expressed how intellectual engagements on explicit media is challenged as not appealing to rational deliberations or as unmoored from empirical backing. In fact, one of the allegations was that being too much engrossed in one's own personal media practices can make one's work be subjected to unwarranted scrutiny, as you will come across as being too proximate to your objective study. So this is where I want to draw your attention to Index uh, Liborium Prohibitorum. It's a list of prohibited books that was deemed morally questionable from 1877, uh, compiled by Henry Spencer Ashby, uh, but he used a pseudonym Pisanus Fraxi to you know, basically come up with this book. So he's at this attempting to distance himself from the erotic charge of the subject that he's uh, working on. When he says that, you know, uh, when I see the naked body of the woman on dissecting a uh, table produces concupiscence in the minds of those who assemble to witness an operation performed upon her. And this is very different from the larger academic discourses currently proliferating in porn studies like by scholars like um, my scholars like Linda Williams, who said that one cannot absolve oneself from any prurian interest when it comes to work on explicit media. So the question, question of the positionality of the porn scholar will recur in the debates on porn again as well. And this is when Porn Studies as a Journal was launched and um, Andy Porn um, scholars like Gail Dines, um, who basically critiqued the journal by saying that all the people in the editorial board seems to be uh, you know, 
propon and hence the journal uh, in itself in the in its kind of intellectual orientation is lacking a fair and balanced scholarship so the relationship between uh, pleasure and agency is a thread that mark upon scholarship for instance how pleasure is defined or what kinds of pleasures are allowed what others are proscribed etc Michel Foucault puts it, uh, you know, that power traverses and produces things. It induces pleasure, forms knowledge, and produces discourse. And the use of sexually explicit representation is where uh, you need to actually think about how it emerged as an anchor for community building. Now, if you look at some of these images, these are all about, you know, promoting and marketing uh, the distribution portfolios of um, adult film videos and video uh, and VHS was one way of uh, adult films entering the Indian market uh, in the 1980s. Now, going back to the, the question about uh, how do sexually explicit media emerges in the earlier phases in the 1960s, especially by avant-garde filmmakers and underground filmmakers who were also kind of aligned with the larger uh, LGBTQ movement. And we can think of works uh, by filmmakers like uh, Kenneth Anger's Scorpio Rising, which is an experimental film, Taylor Mead, um, and also Gregory Markopoulos' uh, Twice a Man. These are kind of, you know, uh, films where you have veiled references to same-sex desire embedded through cultural practices. Twice a Man, for instance, reinvents the Greek myth of Hippolytus, um, killed after rejecting the advances of his stepmother, Phaedra. Um, so Andy Warhol's, um, you know, and before I get to Andy Warhol, Barbara Hammer is um, another kind of um, lesbian filmmaker who uh, engages in intimate kind of portraits and lesbian veil uh, didactics are few of her works, which is emerging again out of the community building um, among, you know, pure community, uh, just to have uh, images that represent their own kind of uh, uh, own kind of sense of belongingness uh, in, on screen because that's where they felt that they are not being adequately represented. Now, uh, going to uh, Andy Warhol's 1964 film, Blowjob, it's a short film on experimental take on the sexual act. And it's focused on a man as he's receiving a blowjob, presumably beneath the frame. We do not get to see it. Um, what we see instead is this expression that you can see right now um, on the screen. Uh, where uh, we actually see his um, uh, his expression, like it keeps on changing, revealing ecstasy, boredom, engagement, dis disengagement, etc. His head lolls around and he stares at the distance and finally smokes a cigarette. So we never get to see the act. In fact, what is exhibited, uh, and then the film was kind of exhibited in the theaters, uh, you know, film, the theater owners were also very skeptical about using the title blow job. And many of the national uh, dailies that published the uh, publicity uh, photos and uh, details of the film said that this is a title that cannot be revealed or a title that cannot be mentioned in a family newspaper, et cetera. So as an artist, artistic statement about heteronormativity, it's also a take on voyeurism and uh, commentary on censorship. So the chiaroscuro lighting with the play of dark and light as the actor looks down, uh, throws his head heads back and you know lets it roll around slightly with patterns undulating across his lips and cheeks. Um, so this is certainly a film that invited queer visibility, even though the media refer to Warhol as asexual. And pornography has played a crucial role for the QR community in their coming out and in identifying with their images, desires, and feelings on screen. So the public space used in both, uh, uh, like Warhol's film, it actually points to the practice of gay place claiming, that was part of the efforts to mobilize visibility around identity formations. And um, journals like, uh, you know. Um, off our back. So there was one journal called On Our Back, uh, which was kind of uh, very conservative in terms of what feminism means. And as a kind of response to it, uh, Dykes came up with this uh, journal called On Our Back. So it's an anti-pornography lesbian journal, uh, which came out in 1984. And it morphed into actually a, a lesbian porn video called Fetale Video. So it's interesting that anti-pornography of uh, feminism also were engaged in producing their own kind of media material, representing what sexual pleasure means. So going now to the scholarship um, on porn, um, the scholarship by Linda Williams, uh, especially her um, a book, Hardcore Power Pleasure and Friends of the Visible and the edited volume Porn Studies contributed a lot to the emergence of porn studies as a discipline. So the boundary pushing function that porn performs is what drew me to it, especially the way uh, 
uh, delegitimized cultural forms holds the potential to reimagine the role of uh, you know, social conditioning, public debates uh, in the collective conscious of society, etc. And it was my engagement with the feminist film theory um, and questions of gender, power, and ideological posturing that uh, made me think more about what Linda Williams referred to as body genres. Um, and my uh, book manuscript, which, uh, which I'm currently working on, it locates the emergence of media publics in Kerala and the varied ways through which the figure of Madhukarani allows us to uh, reframe the debates on sexuality, gender, and caste that mediates uh, the debates on appropriate public behavior. And using softborn films as a case study, this project understands um, how softborn imagination is mediated via censorship debates, transnational media influx that happens with the liberalization of the market in the 1990s, and the anxiety around sexuality as it enters public spaces. So I track uh, essentially the intersection between industry discourses, cultural and ideological factors that condition the formation of adult uh, films in India. Well, the adult film rating in the Indian context refers to an array of factors, including you know, references to violence, sexual references, age appropriate viewing, et cetera. There's always been an um, association of adult films with sex or exposure. And my project is influenced by uh, Igor Kopitov's work on the biography of things. So to offer a biography of things is to follow them as they move through different hands, context and uses. And some of the questions that drive my research includes what constitute pornographic media, the alternative aesthetics that mark these films and what does it tell us about the mainstream film industry when we talk about soft porn as a vantage point to locate the questions of labor, embodiment and subjectivity. And some of the other set of things I look in my book include, you know, production practices, how do they, um, you know, reflect the dominant trends that um, Malayalam cinema was witnessing at that point of time, and how the idea of pornographic itself is emerging um, from the way there are uh, this idea of limits that are already preset that's constantly asking us to push against it. So the discourse of limits, again, is something that interests me. Um, and um, I just want to draw your attention here to Linda Williams' uh, very famous theorization, and which is very uh, kind of <clears throat> formative uh, uh, as far as the field is concerned, called onsinity. And onsinity essentially means it's about simultaneous revelation and concealment that helps us to locate the back and forth slippages between explicit sex and those that are kept off scene, but erupts at unexpected moments. So this kind of slash that separate on and seen it hints at the unstable status that leaves the traces of forbidden love, desire, et cetera. And some of the scholars I um, you know, draw on in my work whose theorization has been crucial for me are Gen Jennifer Nash, Ariana Cruz, and uh, Muriel Miller-Young, all of who work on black porn performers, uh, especially you know, how black porn performers use pornography as a medium to self-fashion their identity. It's important for us to keep in mind, again, working from a different context, but uh, also where uh, you know, ideas of prescription of certain values are already, uh, already in place, is about the respectability politics. And even though black, uh, black culture in itself had certain values that they ascribe to in terms of what respectability means, many of these men veered away from that respectability politics in order to refashion their identities. So the racialized desire can also have different manifestation when we are able to look at the complicated networks through which these films are imagined um, and um, how desire and aspirations are interlinked. One of the things that I'm doing in my book is also to look at the idea of labor and aspiration, how they kind of refashion the identities of starlets. So basically my work uh, looks at 1990s, uh, the liberalization period and the Indian economy, which brought in a whirlwind of changes, including import of American television shows, video cassettes that were imported alongside VS VCRs, influx of goods that signified modernity. So uh, you can um, think about, so uh, this is not anything new for Malayali uh, audience, but again, a poster from Shakila and it's a sequence of a soft porn film. I'm not going into it, but you know what to expect from a soft porn film where you have certain shots that will stand in for a money shot in a hardcore, like massage scenes, et cetera. So this is some of the work that I draw on uh, in my theorization of labor practices. And moving on to the, the kind of the tough uh, shoe I wanted to refer here to. So 1990s, again, was like a very uh, culturally kind of volatile time in India with 
um, liberalization going on one hand, influx of modernity on the other. And then you have this, you know, advertisements, television advertisements, which are catering to this upscale uh, audience. And here you have the tough uh, shoe, ad, uh, shoe ad, which is featuring Milan Suman and Madhu Sepre, uh, where they are appearing nude for a print advertisement in 1995. And uh, another one uh, where you have the Calida art, which is when, when the Swiss, uh, Swiss based innerware uh, company Calida, they came up with an ad in 1998 that showcased Vipasha Basu and uh, Dino Mori, in which Dino is seen pulling off Basu's underwear with the teeth. So, this is the time when you know, there is this kind of um, you know, uh, influx of modernity, but at the same time, there are anxieties, cultural anxieties about what is it going to do in terms of the, the kind of values that are seen as uh, really core to the uh, Indian culture. So, you know, you see about Emma Fuzain and uh, the controversies around uh, his paintings emerging at the same time, protest against Miss World Contest in Bangalore in 1993. And also, you know, what it is to actually have images which have sexual intimacy exhibited in venues like art galleries. And one example would be Lovers by Akbar Padamsi, which again had uh, some bit of contestation around it when it was um, uh, pu publicized, when it was kind of put in a gallery space. So my own uh, journey with uh, sensational media started at a corner shop that my father ran uh, in the early 2000s. And the location of the shop uh, and the diverse crowd catered to um, as it doubled up as a space identified as, the Kerala, uh, as a part of Kerala State AIDS Control Society's uh, targeted intervention uh, for leaving information booklets on AIDS and STDs. Sensational film magazines like Fire, Crime, and others that were pinned up for customers to flip through and buy if it suited their interest. With a condom vending machine on one side and mag magazines dangling from the other side, and the shop also sold cigarettes, milk, and egg. It was a fascinating space to explore how customers would secretly eye at the magazines by maintaining their disinterestedness in the, cr uh, in the crowd around them. But some of them will ultimately end up buying it holding it face up and flipping through the contents till they hit send the spread. These magazines appeal to the scandalizing aspect of what Walter Kendrick associates with pornography. The columns address to the male reader recreated fantasy scenarios through visceral and often explosive accounts of scandals, political stories, and corruption. While the exposure narratives were keen to invoke the tales of lost virginity and transgressive desires, the magazines pantered to the moral panic around policing sexual fantasies by reifying female vulnerability, by portraying women as passive, um, helpless, having stumbled into a wayward life. Uh, so these magazines were both sensational and pornographic in the way it situated the reader as a subject seeking out for lascivious desires. And true to the Greek word pornographos, from which pornography as a term has emerged, the implied wayward woman was imagined as a prostitute. And drawing from pornographers, which means writing about prostitutes, pornography became a broad label used for any written graphic or uh, any other kind of communication that is intended to excite lascivious feelings. And by 1857, uh, uh, the entry uh, of pornography in medical dictionary makes it as a term that is associated with public hygiene. So in, co in course of time, the word pornography, meaning pornographer, means one who writes on prostitutes and pornography, a treatise on prostitution or description of prostitution in relation to public hygiene, they both collapsed. And they basically uh, collapsed into something which re refers to, to the writer of the, you know, of this treatise as pornographer. So the identity of the writer or maker of explicit sex and images and the recipient of these images were again connected by the utility of pleasure as an end in itself. So the moral impact that can be caused by the availability of sexually explicit material to laymen, again, this was a concern from eight, 1850s onwards when sexual artifacts were kind of excavated from Pompeii. And this demanded a systematic cal uh, cataloging and labeling um, so that explicit material can be transported to a secret museum that can be restricted in access so that layman will not be able to uh, put their hands on this material. So this anxiety around laymen or masses were discursively constructed in these formations as irrational, uh, as these people as irrational, as driven to passions, active passions, and that they will not be able to appreciate aesthetic uh, and cultural value of these objects that will be uh, then be uh, you know consumed divorced from their source 
Again, this is going back to this distinction between erotica and porn. Erotica as culturally, you know, esthete, and porn as something which is, you know, uh, which is kind of uh, open to everyone, which is uh, public. And in many ways, it is something which anyone can dabble in. There is there is some kind of democratization that makes anyone porn uh, pornographers at this point of time. So um, the implied um, consumer or addressee in all of these discussions was an elite urban aristocratic men who are able to differentiate disinterested passion from unrestricted emotions. Uh, this, the book, The Secret Museum, if you get a chance, take a look at it. It's one of the really interesting um, accounts on, her, on the cultural uh, you know, value of porn uh, over a period of time. It's a historical work. And here, Walter Country refers that, you know, uh, basically, pornography is not a Western import. And for us, uh, you know, as South Asians, if you look around, we can see different versions of Kama Sutra and other erotic material where, you know, there are also distinctions made between abridged versions and unabridged ver versions and also popular iterations of Kama Sutra. So there is a kind of uh, public uh, space that these materials are currently occupying. And uh, this is one of the reasons why when the Cinematograph Act of 1927 was passed, there was this, uh, there was this kind of uh, anxiety of this mark that percolated into the definition of censorship. So the real need for censorship was because, you know, there are some people who might not be able to appreciate the cultural value of what they are seeing, they are not able to disconnect themselves for a disinterested gaze. And hence, a uh, prescription is required for them to control the masses. So the, the conversations we are having currently with about the censorship and how the appellate authority was crapped, all of which is coming from this idea of the mass or the layman as someone who has to be controlled, who has to be contained and their desires and their uh, ability to act in an unwieldy, unruly way has to be uh, attended to. So uh, the anxiety that you can think about this anxiety in different communication paradigm. And one of this will be the media effects theory, where uh, it says that audience might interpret the eroticized representation as literal prescriptions for life and they will work on it. And this is a strand that is basically aligning with the anti porn kind of, you know, feminist sentiments. Now, um, going to um, a little bit of, you know, um, connection with uh, what we are thinking in today's uh, webinar about the idea of region, why Keralam? Or when I talk about soft porn, why am I uh, using this prefix of Malayalam soft porn? So the, the question of region is something uh, that I want to briefly touch upon, because I think this is also um, in conversation with many of the talks we've had so far, which, uh, which, which is also kind of responding to uh, the cultural material artifacts emerging out of Kerala, responding to Kerala, and where does a region feature here? So, so far, I have given you an outline of the field of porn studies and my connection uh, to the discipline in terms of my research in Malayalam soft porn. But the debates on pornography in the West is substantially different from the kind of debates which we have in India or broadly speaking, South Asia. Um, and one of the reasons is that, you know, you will realize that like most of the South Asian countries, majority of the South Asian countries were ex-colonies. So there is a kind of colonial legal kind of uh, imperative that is still retaining in the legal regulations around sexually explicit media. And uh, this geopolitics of South Asia uh, is also marked in the kind of shared commonalities like colonial subjugation, legal mechanisms, and how they respond to obs obscenity as a kind of a concept. So despite the kind of differences, slight differences in the kind of legal language used, India, Pakistan, Sri Lanka, Bangladesh, and Nepal, all of them have like similar responses to porn. In Pakistan, for instance, the sale of video porn is an offense under section 292 of Pakistan Penal Code. Um, and uh, if you think, if you are familiar with the kind of larger debates on pornography which are happening currently you will uh, remember that you know 2011 there was a hacker claiming to be uh, from pakistan who basically uh, defaced the official website of um, pakistan um, supreme court and pakistan telecommunication authority demanding a blanket ban on all explicit media and this led to a ban on pornographic media but it also simultaneously increased the sale of porn CDs and DVDs. So we saw similar moves in India with the Indian government telecommunication wing issued a notification to the internet service providers to ban 827 websites for hosting pornography content. 
And we also have you know, different um, IT um, regulation acts, um, like the Cyber Cafe uh, Rules 2011, which requests Cyber Cafe owners to equip computers with filtering software to avoid access to porn. And Cafe owners are required to keep all uh, you know, documentation of all websites accessed by the customers for at least a year. And uh, remember, this is 2011. Things have changed a lot now. But you know, think about the kind of conversations we are having right now with the Rajpandra's arrest, and um, you know his own kind of justification, saying that I am making erotica, not porn. So what essentially is porn? That's a question uh, I think it demands more um, kind of attention. So um, I wanted to actually uh, take you briefly into what are the kind of pornographic material that are already pre-existing in South Asia. We know of Malayalam soft porn. We know of Hindi erotic uh, films, etc. Uh, you can see like Gandhi Bath on Art Balaji or, you know, there are kind of a lot of uh, adult content OTT platforms that are emerging at this point of time. But the kind of films I am looking at is uh, basically, from, basically from the celluloid era, you know, not from the digital era, but it's also interesting to think about the South Asian sensibilities that you can see even in Malayalam soft porn. Um, and this is again, you know, one of the activist lawyer who uh, filed a complaint asking the government to come up with a ban on uh, porn uh, website. So he is basically thinking, taking this kind of a anti-porn position and you know where that is coming from. It's also some uh, right-wing sentiments, which is clearly visible in some of the language, which is there in the larger legal document. Now, this is a work which uh, some of you might want to take a look at. This is uh, by Lotte Hawk called Cut Pieces. Um, and it's about cut pieces in Bangladeshi cinema, which has a lot of similarity with Malayalam soft porn. Here, uh, cut pieces are inserted into um, action films. Um, uh, so, you know, it's kind of a, a different uh, sensibility in terms of the audience going and watching an action film, but constantly expecting that the cut piece would appear. And the similar kind of uh, arguments can be made in the case of Malayalam cinema, where there are also cut pieces which are produced separately from the main film. And let's take a quick look at uh, one of the video that uh, Lotte Hawk has produced from her own experience entering uh, uh, theater spaces in Dhaka where these films are being shown. And like in uh, Kerala, most of these theaters are male patrons, but uh, believe it or not, uh, many women also watched Malayalam soft porn. They might not have gone to the theaters to watch it, but uh, market, this is also a form which is again, circulating via DVD. So in my conversation with a lot of library on uh, video library, um, you know, folks, they were like, you know, they were women who came to buy. It's not like it was seen only as a male uh, consumption that's associated with this form. Even when we talk about um, any particular cultural artifacts emerging in a local space, whether it be Kerala, India, or South Asia, it's constantly in conversation with the larger, uh, you know, transnational circuit of media production. So in my, uh, in my work on, on soft porn, and I was kind of looking at how materials from West enters into Indian market and how it fizzles down into uh, different networks in Kerala. Uh, it was interesting to think that, you know, like um, the, the material, the star report, uh, if you are familiar with the, Monica Levinsky, um, Bill Clinton um, controversy. There was this report called the Star Report, uh, which was kind of which was uh, compiled as a kind of an investigative report, but it had a lot of you know uh, verbatim transcription of what uh, Monica Levinsky said during the hearing. And Star Report in India started to circulate as a pornographic book. So it was interesting to know that what was seen as a uh, part of investigation in the West. And uh, you know, it, it's also important to say that it also circulated as pornography, uh, um, abridged forms of pornography in the West. But it was interesting to see some copies which are circulating in India. So just to give you a sense of Star's report, uh, basically it was detailed notations um, and it had a kind of confessional value to it, especially the exact recollection that Levinsky narrated to the committee during the testimony. So the idea of confession or confessional is another kind of strand that I explore in my work. And you know, you can go back to Foucault when he says that confession remains a general standard governing the production on the discourse of sex. So as a genre, pornography seeks to confess the discursive truths of sex. So the, the report, Star's report is again marked by this idea of slipperiness as it brought conflicting desires and takes up multiple pornographic conventions. So the Pornographic object has been uh, designated as porn, not because of an overtly sexual content, because there is nothing sexual about the report, right? 
nothing you know visually kind of captivating or even you know we have erotic fiction we have visual porn print pornography as well as visual pornography but there was also this idea of you know speculating a fantasy scenario what might possibly have happened that is also in the realm of fantasy that is adding into it becoming pornography or uh, another example here of, of videos that were circulating in india from the west was um, tommy lee a uh, drummer motley uh, crow and uh, pamela anderson's baywatch home video that was circulated as pornography when it was uh, stolen by an electrician and distributed and this could be one of the earliest viral video not viral video in the digital sense but you know viral in the sense of circulating in a in a kind of a speed that one can not imagine because you know people were making copies and then you know circulating it so uh, it it gives a new um, understanding about the affective undertones of what it means to basically share this kind of um, clandestinely um, procured content and lee and anderson's video was a home video actually it was produced as a home video for their own kind of purpose of documenting the intimacy together but um, you know and it shows the shows them in mundane everyday activities they're watching uh, something they are walking so it is not anything about a sexual act captured there as well so it combines boredom and titillation domestic and pornographic and and that is what gave the tape the credential as an authentic tape it was not staged it was not staged for a viewer it was staged for something else and we can question the kind of you know ethical kind of breach that went into procuring something that was meant for you know private use as uh, being forcefully put into public that's the question that we need to discuss when we talk about pornography but my major con uh, contention in the in my uh, book is that while we are kind of getting trapped in this idea of exploitation that all pornography is exploitative all pornography uh, has the potential to become uh, you know child pornography or uh, involving some amount of human trafficking what we are losing sight of is the the kind of you know uh, kind of individual uh, parameters uh, that allows people to actually be part of this industry there are a lot of people who work as uh, escorts there are a lot of sex workers who consider this as part of their labor it's their bodily labor so you are actually delegitimizing the kind of labor that goes into it uh, because of kind of a moralistic kind of language that you use to define uh, what is work what is labor etc so um just to give you a sense of you know like the feminist porn intervention that i do in my book book it's also drawing from the conversation which are emerging from the west uh, about how we can look at cultural objects which are delegitimized uh, seen as trash as you know cultural waste as nothing you know uh, nothing uh, socially re uh, redeemable about them how can you actually use those materials to understand the larger cultural infrastructures that condition its production so in my work you know i basically uh, you know work with the people who uh, made these films the actresses who acted in these films the people who made the cut pieces who uh, worked as technicians and soft porn as an industry was fictitious so one of the reasons why my work took over a period of you know 10 years uh, was primarily because it's very hard to actually find the people who were behind the making of the film who do not want to be found there are one or two names you know sarjan or ap joy but that's not uh, you know defining the industry in its entirety so when you are working uh, on an open ended project where you think that every day you might find something new that you might want to revise your you know thesis and uh, speculative narrative on it puts a little bit of you know pressure on you to also come up with a kind of conceptual anger and that is where feminist media intervention becomes very important so what feminist porn studies does is to basically foreground the ethical practices in procuring material so you know somebody who works in soft porn can very well write a very sensational account of soft porn but what we are losing sight of there is the labor that goes into it or uh, you know totally get blindsided by how does the distribution um, mechanism work how are these films being financed and when these films enter the middle east and gulf how are they being consumed by the migrant population from south asia so these are questions which i am using in my work to actually um, you know complicate the idea of sexually explicit media as just sex so instead what i am trying to do is to understand how these practices are drawing from the larger you know sentiments uh, that animate 
the way people worked as peripheral labor. So uh, you would be surprised to know that the mutual aid that we are talking about at this point of time during the pandemic, when people who do not have uh, you know, a living wage uh, are being supported by people who can earn. So, you know, like the salary cut, uh, which, is, which is going to support someone who doesn't have a wage during the pandemic, is something that sex workers, collectives, and pornograph uh, pornography industry uh, through free, uh, free speech coalition had done in 1980s because they know that they are uh, at the periphery and they are vulnerable and the state is not going to support them. So they had to come up with their own kind of survival tactics and strategies in order to float um, during stressful times.